today I wanted to talk about virtue and its different faces. Um, Howard Wass makes a point at the beginning of the chapter called Virtue in Public that um, liberal society tends to bifurcate virtue into two different categories, public and private. And the point that he makes is a decent one. He says that, you know, the problem with that is that liberal society tends to think that the private virtues are secondary and separable to the public virtues. Um, that, you know, in other words, what you do in the privacy in your own life um, is your business and you can do it any way you want. Um, but when you're in the marketplace or you're a citizen voting or whatever, you're supposed to exhibit certain virtues that are conducive to doing business or being a democratic citizen. Harawas wants to make the argument, which is not a new one, that you can't separate these so easily, that a person can't be a total jerk, bad person in, in their private life and then turn around and suddenly be you know, an upstanding citizen or, you know, honest in the marketplace. And so it matters, in his view, that society have this notion of the good life, that, that it have some common agreement of the good that is more than just the bare minimum of what it takes to do business and, and you know, be a voter. Uh, so, so far, so good. Now, what I wanted to do this time before I delve into Harawas' uh, argument a little bit more is just to make sure that people understand what he means by virtue and what we mean by virtue and how many different versions of virtue there's been, okay? So I want to take some time and maybe you'll see yourself in some of these descriptions. The categories I'm going to cover are aristocratic virtue, Christian virtue, bourgeois virtue, and hyper-bourgeois virtue. The latter is a category of my own, but I think you'll recognize it. Are you a hyper-bourgeois virtue person, or are you something else? We'll see. So where Harawas tends to come from in this chapter that I read is actually like the comparison of modern public virtue with this older Aristotelian notion of virtue. So the Aristotelian notion of virtue, or we call it aristocratic virtue, because it had to do with the idea that some people inevitably in a society, which was the case in ancient times, even during democracy, that some people had way more like power and wealth and privilege than others, and that they should use it for themselves, but that the highest good for them was to be admired by others. So they, they weren't to just be some jerk that goes off and does their own thing any way they want. That wouldn't be admirable. They had to be brave and they had to, you know, be big, big soul, right? They had to be generous or magnanimous, giving to others, not so much that they wouldn't have enough for themselves, but because they had so much of either wealth or wisdom, they could, it would spill over and benefit everybody else, and they would gain their admiration. Um, honor, by the way, is, is uh, something I've written several books on. Um, I went through Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and then Tocqueville on the concept of honor and how most, mostly the liberal thinkers um, don't let, take kindly to the concept of honor because it's, it causes conflict, because people fight over honor. Um, if they're insulted, if their family is insulted, if their society is insulted. Um, and so honor is such a compelling virtue, it can cause people to fight. Um, so, you know, the aristocratic virtues were about greatness. Right? And that doesn't sound very democratic or liberal. Moderation or self-control was a big one. That, you know, if you didn't have self-control, how could you have any of the other virtues? Right? You had to have yourself under control and not just be some slob that just, you know, parties all the time or does whatever they want. You have to have the self-control to be, to have physical courage, for instance, which was the courage that they admired physical courage, and then moral courage, too, to like stick to what you believed in, right? Wisdom was a very high virtue. 
um, that could only be had, they thought, by the few and should be used to, to teach, to make other people wise to the extent they could and to rule. The wise should rule because they had more, more knowledge, more steadiness than, than anybody else in society. So these were the aristocratic virtues and they rubbed people the wrong way as society became more egalitarian, you might say. Part of what tended people towards more egalitarianism is Christianity, at least in you know, its influence in the West. The Christian virtues were more egalitarian um, because there was this all good, powerful God conceived as above everyone else. And so everyone else was equal in that regard, whether they were rich or poor. So there was always this theme of, yes, there's, there's ranks and gradations in society, but in, in some way, we are all brothers and sisters. Um, the Christian virtues stem from this overwhelming awareness that something far greater than people is at play. And so humility, for instance, is a great virtue under Christianity, whereas in the ancient concept, I mean, it just didn't compute. You know, humility happened when you had to, you know, it wasn't something that you would, would be unless you had to. Those who had to, you know, were servants of those who did not have to. Um, obedience stemmed from this, obedience to God, um, and also to the church and to church authorities. Charity, the, the, uh, the type of love that is self-giving and self-sacrificing or altruistic, even to the point of giving everything away, is admirable, whereas in the ancient view that would have just been kind of stupid. You know, like, yes, you should give things away, but not certainly not to your, um, the loss of your own well-being. Purity in all respects, moral purity, sexual purity, um, is valued under Christianity, whereas um, in ancient times that really wasn't even an issue. Uh, and it stems from, again, from this notion of an all-powerful God and a God with certain moral standards, right, that comes in here with Judeo-Christianity. Um, and then, of course, reverence to God and faith in this one God are also considered virtues. So there's a shift there, and you can see that there is a sort of lowering and leveling and a notion that it is possible for individuals across the socioeconomic spectrum to be truly virtuous because the requirements of Christian virtue are things that ordinary mortals who aren't wealthy and powerful can attain through simply a better relationship to God and through really trying hard, okay? So out of the Christian virtues, you might say, as society moved into the uh, era of mercantile economic activity, of more and more people not simply um, gaining wealth by inheriting it, but by making it through their own labor, right, and through their own business activity, the, this new class rises up slowly, the bourgeois class. And that lifts a lot of the people who already had a sense of their underlying equality into a position of some influence and power in society to where they started to ask for political and economic power. They began to wield those things. And so their values took center stage. And the bourgeois virtues, of course, buttressed their activity. So they were the virtues that you needed in order to do business and to be a peaceable, law-abiding citizen. So this is where that split happened that Hauerwas talks about between the private and the public. And these were the public virtues that you needed in the marketplace and as a voter, okay, as a citizen to be able to get along with others, to compromise, to negotiate, because the great enemy of commercial activity is war. Didn't stop people, but at least there was this concept 
<laughs> that the great enemy of business was war, at least that was that was the idea. Now I'm thinking, no, it's actually like its greatest friend. But anyway, we're talking about ideals and concepts here. So the bourgeois virtues included honesty and reliability and fairness. Those were all necessary to do business because if you get a reputation for not being any of those things, no one's going to want to do business with you, make a contract with you or anything. You're dead in the water there. Thrift was important. Now it's debt. You know, how much leverage can you have? But uh, for quite a while, in order to have capital that you could wield to develop your business or to buy more land, um, you had to have the self-control to save. This was something that, that's a picture of Ben Franklin. He was all about these bourgeois virtues, and definitely thrift and frugality was, was one of them. Patience and politeness were necessary to get along both in the marketplace and in civil society because, you know, it wouldn't do well, it would disrupt things too much to disagree. So you can see how, um, you know, it's, it became a virtue to smooth things over and to find common ground and to not needlessly insult people. Whereas in, say, the ancient period, I mean, you know, <clears throat> an insult was a challenge. It needed to be met. Same thing during the feudal period amongst the, you know, the aristocrats. You get to the Christian uh, the more Christian influence there, there is, um, the less this type of thing is encouraged, this insulting and kind of chest-puffing behavior because it is a sin, right? It's, it's the sin of pride. And then you get to the bourgeois period where it's just kind of stupid, you know? Why do that? Why not, you know, be nice? Niceness became like a huge virtue. So now we have, you know, people running around being trained to smile and look polite, probably like can't stand their job, but they but they need to do this to make the sale. All right, and then finally, I would argue we've entered a new period where the hyper-bourgeois virtues are competing with the bourgeois and previous virtues. And you can see how, to a certain extent, they stem from the older bourgeois virtues because they emphasize the individual, and you know the individual rights, but there are differences. Identity has become a big deal since the 1960s. Um, we've undergone this this transformation in our ideals towards authenticity. You know, Charles Taylor wrote a book about that, right? Um, the age of authenticity, uh, and now you know to be a real person and to feel as though one is worthy and to be admired, one needs to be authentic, which means that, you know, there's a great emphasis on discovering who you are, what's really in you, and then expressing it openly, both for your own, like, satisfaction with your identity, but also so that other people can recognize it. So now, instead of recognizing, let's say, your, your, your wealth or your power, uh, or maybe in addition to those things, people are seeking recognition for their unique identity. Um, absolute freedom is a virtue. You know, we've moved from this era where, you know, compromise really was kind of seen as a necessity to more of a situation where more and more people are thinking, not, not if it means that I have to curtail my freedom to look a certain way, to be a certain way, to say whatever I want, to do whatever I want. Um, no, you know, so of course people's absolute freedom is clashing <laughs> and, and we're having more and more bicker sessions on Twitter and social media plays into this in a huge way. It's encouraged this, but also the capitalist economy, which which first you know needed the bourgeois virtues to develop, has metastasized into this situation where, in order to make more and more markets, it benefits from the hyper fragmentation of our culture and our even the hyper fragmentation of individuals into different identities and different interests and different uh, aspects of their lives, different different needs to express themselves in a variety of ways. It's just, 
endless. You know, at a certain point, I think we ran out of actual useful stuff that people could buy. And so now we are buying our very selves. And there's an endless supply of marketing for that, right? And, and going along with that, there's the virtue of pace setting. What I mean by that is that these days, in order to be an admirable person, to feel good about yourself, you need to be on top of an ever escalating rate of change, right? Like no, bo no other period in history have people had to keep up with such change, but the change is necessary to keep the commercial economy going. Um, things become obsolete, and so this spills over into even the, uh, you know, the way we dress, our language. You have to be up on the latest language twists and turns, the latest technology, the latest media, and if you're behind, you're not as hip, and uh, suddenly you lose influence. Um, creativity and style is a part of that, showing that you're on top of the latest trends bigger than ever before. And all of this is definitely exacerbated by and really encouraged by social media. And guess what social media is really about? It's about selling you stuff and increasingly stuff that isn't material or is only marginally material. Um, and so we have the hyper-bourgeois virtue of influence. Everybody wants to be an influencer. The ideal is now to be an influencer, to be able to use social media to express a person's unique individual self and to hopefully get other people to follow. And yes, does that contradict hyper-bourgeois individualism? It does. And, and, you know, even in the previous iteration of bourgeois individualism and vir bourgeois virtues, it was noted by Tocqueville that at the same time people pursue their individual self and their individual rights, they become followers. Why? Because it's just so taxing to actually be an individual and um, it's not really what most people actually can bear or want. So anyway, I would just ask you to contemplate these four categories. I think that it will help, and just contemplating them will help me as I go back in and take another look at what Hauerwas thinks public virtue versus private virtue means and what he would want um, instead of those things. What does he mean by a type of political virtue? So we'll see that um, next time, and we'll see you next time. Bye.